everybody thinks all I ever do is watch Alice make the lunches and then I take credit and hand them to the kids. That's not all I do. I also watch Alice make dinner. Pork chops, applesauce, pork chops again, more applesauce. You get the picture. But I really have to take credit for the real thing, the most important job that I do, which is being the heart and soul and center of this very hot mess of a blended family. Before we became the bunch that you know and love, two very major tragedies happened in the lives of our combined six children. The girls lost their father and the boys lost their mother, leaving them all alone. But Mike and I created such a happy, lovely home for them and we even took them on the honeymoon, which was a little bit weird, but they came on the honeymoon anyway. We created such a happy home for them that they forgot all about their original parents that died. And, you know, we haven't even talked about them since. So I pat myself on the back a little bit for that. Not that it's been perfect. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of um, civil rival, sibling rivalry going on. You know, it's always Marsha, versus Jan, they've always got issues. Peter, he's always got some kind of self-esteem stuff going on, you know, that's why we have to say pork chops and applesauce all the time. Um, Cindy and Bobby are always fighting, and Marsha and Greg, they've been getting high, like in the living room and in the family room and who knows where else. And I know that because Cindy is such a tattletale, but, I think that the worst thing and the hardest thing about this blended family was moving into a house where there was already a woman there. Okay, and don't even get me started on the vacations. We had to bring Alice with us on all of the vacations that we go on. We had to bring her, you know, to Hawaii, to the Grand Canyon, where, you know, she rode the horse and everything like that. She even came along on our honeymoon. So it's been rough having this other woman in the house. Wherever you go, She's there. See what I mean? All right, Alice, is it time for me to watch you do the dusting now? Gotta go. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to Living Figuratively. This is the 54th episode. We snuck in a quick 53rd episode yesterday when I was down at the um, Veterans Memorial Museum in Columbus seeing Neri White's absolutely fabulous show. I had to just pull out my camera and start, you know, doing a little spontaneous living figuratively. So if you didn't catch that, catch it. I'm going to put both of them up on my YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, but welcome to Living Figuratively. This is the show that asks the question, why not fill your home with the fascinating faces and figures of people that you don't even know? Why not fill your home with figurative art? Each week, I take you to a different area of my home to show you art that I collect, or I show you my own art, or I take it out on the road and show you art in our Ohio community. Today, we're staying home, hunkering down on our April Fool's snowy day, um, right here in the kitchen for Kitsch in the Kitchen. So, what's Kitsch? That's the big question. Kitsch is defined by Merriam Webster, the dictionary, as something that's lowbrow, low quality, but people like it and are amused by it anyway. So it also, with some of the other definitions of kitsch, are that it's um, it pulls on the heartstrings with sort of exaggerated, passionate feelings that everybody understands, like the main things. The main things that make up life, like love and passion and death and sadness and heartbreak and just, you know, those the basic simple emotions. And it spells those out very plainly with art, um, without any irony. Kitsch has also been accused of being out of touch with the times, of not being of today, of not being the kind of art that should be made today, it's old fashioned. Figurative art has been accused of exactly those same things. And um, there's a, uh, I'm going to show you the work of Odd Nerdrum. I don't have any of his work in my collection, but I do have this very fabulous, super heavy book of Odd Nerdrum's work. 
Odd Nerdrum is a contemporary figurative realist who has adopted the word kitsch as part of his own movement. He has been criticized using all the adjectives that I just told you about what kitsch art is, being like, you know, passionate and old fashioned and tugging on the heartstrings and stuff like that. Um, and he has decided to adopt the, the kitsch moniker as a positive thing, much like when the Impressionists back in the 1800s um, were insulted by being called Impressionists. You know, they said, oh, that's not a real picture of haystacks, that's an impression of haystacks. And so they were like, heck yeah, we're Impressionists. And they took it as a positive and have been, you know, popular ever since. So Ad Nerdrum has been accused of all, the, all things kitsch, and he is taking it on as a positive. I'm going to just show you some of his work in this book, since I don't have any of his work in my collection, and just show you what, what he means by that. This painting is just purely scary. It's like a scary, scary scene that he did. This painting right here is sad. It's called Vigil. It's really just, you know, somebody dying. It's like the simple sadness of that. And then he's also got gorgeous, gorgeous paintings of children. Like, this is beautiful. Um, beautifully done, simple, maybe sentimental. And then he's got love. So he's got these embrace pictures, which other artists have, you know, done similar, similar things like this. But they're just sort of this very visceral embrace. You know, pure and simple passion. And then, of course, the embrace, the mother and child type of love, which, you know, this one is just, you know, beautiful like that. Now, he's got other stuff that goes a little bit more weird. I'm just gonna casually flip through and you'll just find some more weird stuff. So, I feel like his type of kitsch is not what I consider kitsch, but since he's called that movement kitsch, um, I'm on board with it and it's cool. I would like to see what Odd Nerdrum's kitchen looks like. And since we have no way of knowing that, and you guys came to this show to see my kitchen. Let's get started with my kitchen. So when we first built our kitchen, we did made all kinds of little you know, decisions. We have a single slab of granite for our countertop here, which so it doesn't have to have a seam in it. Had this fun little cook's nook, which I call it, it was my little invention, where I could sit here, eat something, while people are sitting at the counter eating something. Um, one of the things that I've done since I've started doing li Living Figuratively is I've joined some interior decorating Facebook pages so that I can insert my little comments every once in a while and convince people to um, hang figurative art in their homes. One of the questions, there's a, a particularly fun page that I've joined, which I recommend for you guys. It's called Interior Design Ask Anything. And the number one question that people always ask is, what shade of white should I paint my kitchen cabinets? Apparently everybody wants to get rid of the orange oak that was so cool, you know, 15, 20 years ago and paint their kitchen white. The number two question that everybody asks is, what kind of backsplash should I use? What kind of little geometric tiles and patterns should I do to create a backsplash behind my counters? So my question for that is, how messy do you really think you're gonna be? I mean, are you bringing home like barrels of freshly caught fish and dumping it on the counter like where the fish are flipping around, spreading water all over the place? Are you keeping the top off your blender? So like when you use your blender, it goes all over the place. Are you getting into fights with your family where you're throwing full cups of coffee at each other? You know, how messy are you gonna be? Do you really need to have backsplash all the way up the back like you're like a swimming pool, like an indoor swimming pool. I personally would rather have the wall color and a nice wall color, which this one right here is Benjamin Moore Soft Pumpkin, and I love it, live it with it, and have sworn by it for 15 years. It wasn't trendy then, it's not trendy now, it's just a color that I love. It's kind of a little bit candlelight, a little bit warm, and so that's what I have for there. And I just have this little backsplash. It's just about that much so that if you do get some water on the counter, it doesn't trickle back behind and cause mold and stuff. And I say that's plenty. So, but since we're moving along in the kitchen and you wanted to see kitchen in the kitchen, 
Let's start with this little kitsch area over here. So this little area, I've got these little creature people. My kind of kitsch is not so much, it's not so much theme dependent, um, like I'm not like a cat person or an owl person or whatever. It's the design sensibility of what these little creatures and people look like. I love the anthropomorphism of it. So over here, I've got a little set of three odd, odd little friends. Um, this one was in an antique store billed as a Dumbo, though I like, I, if he was actually Dumbo, I wouldn't have bought him if he looked like Dumbo, because for me, trademark characters as kitsch has no place in my life. That, ooh, I don't like it at all. What I like about him is that he's got the chubbiness. He's mostly the white fist. He's painted with sort of these brush strokes and he's an anthropomorphic useful thing. So he's like a pitcher. And because I'm a little bit weird myself, I have my little wooden spoon coming out of his mouth as his little tongue. Behind him is a moon that I painted years ago back when I was doing pottery painting. And, um, I, you know, because it was something that I could do while the kids were napping real quick at the kitchen table. And it was something that I also went to these mom's groups where we all went pottery painting together at these pottery painting places that seem to be around all the time. I don't know that there's any left anymore, but they were very popular back in the, you know, early 2000s. Um, so I have many things that are pottery painted and I, I made a sort of a purposeful decision to stick to a certain color grouping because I wanted them all to match. They're all gonna be my, you know, serving pieces and stuff. So I made a decision to stick to certain color groupings, you know, the bright red, the bright yellow, the bright blue, the bright purple, bright green. Um, and also with a star, moon, or sun theme, which I'm not a star, moon, sun person, so that's not the, that's not the reason for it. It's because I thought it was a nice way to nail down and sort of have some structure and um, commonness to the different pieces that I was painting. And I painted a lot, a lot, a lot of them. You'll see more as we proceed in the kitchen. Um, behind him here, I've got this little 1973 vintage Pillsbury Doughboy before the Pillsbury Doughboy became the sort of the cuter, more chubby, a little bit more realistic, if there you can apply that word to the Pillsbury Doughboy character that he became. This sort of has the old timey charm and maybe innocence of something that isn't yet fully formed. It's kind of like when, when the Simpsons, do you remember when the Simpsons were on the Tracy Ullman show? They were just a little bit less Simpsons-y. And it, 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 I like that old oldness of it. And then across, the salt container here is their little friend, the little Dutch boy guy. So the three of these together, um, I love the way their eyes are. They have this sort of blank kind of look, a little bit of a stunned stare and it, the chubbiness and the mostly the white bisque, the brush strokey paintedness, they're not painted realistically. Um, so that's kind of my kitsch sensibility and I will show you where I have a little bit more. Over here, we have my lovely windowsill, which is the four, the, in right in front of our lovely winter day here on April Fool's Day in Cleveland. We woke up to a whole bunch of snow and it's starting to melt a little bit maybe. But this is my view when I do the dishes or when Alice does the dishes, but you know. Um, and this, this little, the way that I've arranged this little group in here, it started based on these little owl guys, okay? Back once upon a time, when my kids were little, my husband took them to my favorite store for before my birthdays and stuff, um, and to have them pick out something at Anthropology to give me for my birthday. Because, you know, he knew that I'd like it, it's Anthropology, and I love everything from there. So, years ago, one of the things the kids picked out um, were these little owl guys. They, this one is a, uh, a pitcher, and the other two are little, little owl mugs. And I love the look of them, and I'm thinking they possibly subliminally set the tone for the kind of kitsch that I like. I love the fact that they are, I'm going to move this so you can see, um, I love the fact that they're chubby, 
that they have a certain type of charm that's not too trademarky Disney or anything like that. And they have the very subdued colors. And they go perfectly with, look at this, I've got another little Dutch boy guy who is the same, the same pattern or the same mold as the other little Dutch boy guy that I had over there. And that's one of the things as you're antiquing, once you find one thing, then suddenly you'll find another one just like it, but maybe painted differently. And I like to get it just because you never know. You don't want to let it go and wish you had another one. So I've got a little Dutch boy here and he's got a friend and I'm sort of varying the heights and stuff like that. His little friend is this nun. And you, one might think that I'm trying to like, you know, do like a little religious spiritual thing here, but really I like this little nun because she has the same design sensibility as the, uh, as the little, little owls with the gray and the white and the little painted eyelashes, like she's got the same expression as the Dutch boy. She bridges the gap between the Dutch boy and the owls. And she just makes a nice little, you know, little piece of kitsch there. Now, uh, also you may notice that I have plants on the uh, windowsill. I'm not a plant person. Every plant that has entered our home, it's because the plant was a gift. And many plants die prematurely in our home and then get the booth pretty easily. Um, I do want to call your attention though to this particular pot which has uh, one of our newer plants in it that's still li alive and thriving. This pot was created by Leela Khoury who is a ceramicist and sculptor and, um, and architect actually now. She has an MFA in uh, architecture too who about five years ago she was arranging a GoFundMe because she had created a sculpture of the Syrian poet um, uh, Nizar Kabani. I'm, I am positive that I'm pronouncing it wrong, but at least I think I got the name right, Nizar Kabani, to be in the uh, Syrian sculpture gardens in Cleveland. So she wanted to cast it in bronze, which is very, very, very expensive, um, the bronze casting process. And so she was raising, uh, arranging a GoFundMe to get money for that. And one of the benefits and wonderful things about contributing to an artist's GoFundMe is you'll get little perks. And so she made me two beautiful pots. Um, I hope it's not disrespectful or bad to put flowers in it, but it's actually the flowers are in their own little pot. So I, I didn't put dirt in there. And when that flower dies, then get the boot and the pot will still be clean. So that's good. Um, and so I've got other plants on there too, just different heights and stuff like that. And you, know, you can see through out to, the, out to the yard. So let's keep on moving over. One of the fun things that I didn't even notice until I was sort of doing a little quasi arrangement for this show is that my two coffee carafes um, have this anthropomorphic quality to them. They're little birds. Here's the eyes, here's the beak, here's the elbow or whatever, the back fin, I'm not even sure. And all that is right next to my absolute favorite, wonderful kitchen item, my KitchenAid stand mixer, which the other day I mixed up two giant mountains of meat worth of meatloaf meat without, you know, having a mess my elbows up with it because you know how hard it is to like stir meat together with the different stuff that you put in meatloaf this the elbow the whatever the meat hook on it was just perfect i mean it, it's i love my KitchenAid stand mixer and no i'm not an influencer and no they're not paying me i am just a satisfied customer and i love it in red i've got a little red theme going here which brings us to the little corner here okay so in this corner we have this funky nativity of sorts it's really not a nativity but this afternoon I just started looking at it thinking eh, it's kind of a nativity we've got all my little kitsch characters standing around standing around worshiping the spoon rest awaiting the arrival of the bowl scraper the holy holy bowl scraper and there it is um, the the whole theme with this 
the, the Madonna, I guess the, the central character here, is Sophia. She's a cookie jar, but we don't keep cookies in her because her top is really, really heavy and I don't want it to break and the cookies would get stale. So we just leave her be as a ceramic creature. Um, the history behind Sophia and why she got her name. Years ago, 2006, I believe it was, we uh, bought our first vacation rental property at Holiday Valley. We bought a 1970s condo and decided to paint it orange because when it's cold, it's nice to bring the sunshine inside. So we painted it bright orange and then I started looking for orange accessories. The one of the very first accessories that I found was a cookie jar just like her, only in orange. Like all, everything that was red on her was orange. And it was kind of amazing because like, oh, this is gonna be, she's gonna set the tone. And she did. So I started doing paintings with Sophia in the paintings and putting her in little scenarios where the um, Mrs. Butterworth's bottle was her mother and oh, just different things. You'll see, I'll do another episode all about that and you'll you know, know what I'm talking about. But anyway, so I got this little character and um, like what I said before, when you go antiquing and you get something that's cool that you love, suddenly you might find it again at a different antique store and in a different color. And so I started finding more of these Sophias and I call them Sophias all the time. They're, it's really a little red riding hood, but I found one for home and she's bright red the way she's supposed to be. And she goes along with all the bright red that I have here. And I put her, parked her in this corner. Now she was all alone, much like the Brady girls until, you know, or the Brady boys until, you know, the, they met and became a bunch until I found this little, her little sister, her little Cindy to her Jan, who at a, at a um, antique store too. And she's got her own special weirdness that I also enjoy. The whole thing where she's a planter. Where, and there's a whole bunch of planters out there where these little people or animals or you know anthropomorph anthropomorphic creations have these giant butts and there's a big hole in the butt and you're supposed to grow a plant out of that butt hole. Um, so it's kind of funny. I like it. It's got its own special kits to it. And she has a little bit of a creepy look to her. Like maybe she's a little jealous of her older sister who's just beautiful and pure, much like, you know, Jan and Marsha. Anyway, so I put her over here as sort of the, the little sister friend and I really needed some people or creatures or something to round out the other side. So I found these two little bird guys um, on eBay. This one, yes, is an owl chick, but it doesn't mean that I'm an owl person. I liked the sensibility of this owl chick thing and this other type of bird. And I love the way that their heads are split wide open so that they can be pour cream out of them. There's just a fun coolness to them. So that's my kitsch in the kitchen. Um, I'm going to walk you over. I'm going to finish up today with something that is not kitsch, but is super, super popular. Okay. So I have this super popular painting up here. This is called Right and Better Left Unsaid. And he's spending this, you know, sort of home stretch time here in our kitchen, hanging out in our kitchen. Uh, because he's going to be going to his forever home um, fairly soon because he has been purchased by a loving collector and I am thrilled about that, though a little bit sad about that because I'm going to miss him, but I'm also thrilled about it that he's going to be going to a good home. And he's been literally, I believe, one of my most popular paintings. He's won all kinds of awards, won a couple best in shows. Um, he has also never been rejected from a show. He's shown at the Buckland Museum, um, and he's been reproduced as a, uh, a couple monoprints that uh, have been purchased by a couple people at uh, Zygo Press. So, um, you know, he's very, very popular. And, um, and I'm letting him hang out in the kitchen until, you know, it's time, to, time for him to go. So, thank you. Thank you for joining me tonight for Living Figuratively. Um, 
It was really fun having you come to my kitchen to see my kitchen. Next week, we're taking the show out on the road and we're being welcomed back to the Valley Art Center, this time for the illustrious alumni show where I'm going to be part of it and my Epiphany of Pandora and Eve paintings will be part of it. Um, it's all about, it's a show about people who have, who have, who are, you know, artists in the area that have achieved some recognition or whatever, you know, calling us illustrious, um, who have at some point during their careers taken classes at the Valley Art Center, which I have. So that's really fun. And it's also, at the same time, there's going to be a group of painters called the Whiskey Painters showing in the same space. And if you don't know what the Whiskey Painters are, you will just have to tune in next week to find out because I don't know a whole lot about them, but I'm interested in finding out and I'll tell you all about them. So thank you for joining me for Living Figuratively tonight. Come back next week, same bad time, same bad channel, Thursday night, April 8th, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Y'all come back now, you hear?